If you're an adult amateur horse lover who wonders what it takes to make magic with horses, you're in the right place. I'm Paige Lockton, and this is The Magic of Horsecraft. Join me for conversations with wizards in the world of horsecraft about the ingredients needed to build connection with horses and courage in life. Turns out these things are connected. How do I know? <laughs> like most things, I learned the hard way. I lost the magic I once had with horses. In regaining it, I discovered that the elements of connection are learnable. Whether you ride your horses forwards, backwards, or sideways, stick around for stories that show us how we are the same and that anything is possible. Take a chance. Welcome to episode four, if you're doing them in order. There is a little bit of a journey, although I think they can be taken at any time. They come often with trigger warnings, and this one is no different. So we are talking about trauma and our recovery from it, and you should be warned. On that note, welcome to the show. Boy, it's going to be a lot of fun from here today, isn't it, Paige? <laughs> well, it, uh, it may not be all shits and giggles, or as my friend Kim said, all buttercups and daisies, but that's life, isn't it? And no one knows this more than my guest today, Kim Walness. I've known about Kim Walness since I was 10 or 12 years old because I grew up in the 80s as a horse crazy kid and most of my equestrian friends um, will know a lot about her backstory. And for those of you who don't, to try to cram it in here as a little introduction to the podcast is a pretty big ask <laughs> because Kim has one of those lives that isn't just documentary worthy or worthy of a Disney movie or worthy of, I think we're more in line with Netflix series worthy, <laughs> that kind of life. And when you have a Netflix series worthy life, it comes as a mixed blessing. It means that you haven't just had highs, um, but you've been tested for sure. So um, Kim is a good example of this. In um, the early part of Kim's story, when I got to know her, it was all fairy tales and gumdrops, or as close as it could be from the, our viewpoint on her life. She had found the Grey Goose, an unlikely horse to bring home as the prospect, from a posting that she had when she accompanied her military husband to Ireland for a posting. And um, she worked with a very fearful horse and had all kinds of crazy adventures and accidents with him and stories about his early beginnings that had her recognize his fear and work with it instead of against it and gain his trust to the point where at their peak, and this is in part of the podcast, at the 1982 World Championships in Lemulin, that horse was able to carry her around the last half of what probably would have been then 11 or 12 minute cross-country course of epic proportions back in the days. They were proper endurance tests. And usually that means that in the last half of the endurance test, as a rider, you are now supporting a horse and really actively helping it carry its body across the, the ground and get the job done in the end. And she wouldn't be able to do that at the last half of this course because she had two transverse fractures in her lower back. <laughs> they were only five weeks from injury into the healing, just healed up well enough to get her halfway through the course. And after the second element of a double combination of very large tables when he had to really stretch and she had to stretch with him she opened up those transverse fractures and landed with instantaneous knowledge that from here on in it was all up to the gray and she was just going to hang on like baggage essentially and he had um was encumbered back in that day and age because she was a small woman in sport we further encumbered her with 20 pounds of lead that her horse had to carry that wouldn't have moved elegantly with his back in the same way as a rider would so the gray goose basically had to understand in a heartbeat 
that the team counted on him to cross the finish lines. She and Gray were the anchor men that year. They were one rider down. They had to cross the finish line or the team was eliminated. And that it was going to be up to him if he thought he could do that without her, with her just kind of hanging on and telling him what's coming. And he went, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and she tells us about that moment in the podcast. And off we went. Um, just spectacular. So we, we grew up with stories about triumph like this and watched him retire at the pinnacle of his career at a ceremony at the Rolex Kentucky three-day event in 1988. I was 18 years old and my parents bought me tickets <laughs> to go watch. We just knew it as Rolex then. Um, <laughs> the Kentucky three-day event and watch a couple of my heroes. And they, I now had coaches at this level who were competing and trying out for the Olympic Games. Um, Nick Holmesmith and his entourage, David Walding Davies, Shalane Kozak, Jackie Beck, were all down there. I was going to meet them all, watch them compete. And at this competition, I remember there being a ceremony for the retirement of Kim Walness's The Grey Goose. And we watched them play over, um, well, it looked different back in the day. The arena was grass and it was hilly and it had fences spread out all across it. And she was trying to find something, some way she could show her joy and that they were still able to jump stuff without jumping the championship course that <laughs> we're waiting for the final 10 riders to tackle. And um, she found something she could jump and it was an oxer backwards and they flew over it and made all of us kind of gasp and giggle and just played around to show how much they still had. And that stood with me from that day. So back in the day, Kim was known as uh, being a bit kooky because she spoke to her horse. And Jack Lagoff used to say before she went on the start course, start short tape recorder, Mother Goose. <laughs> She was known as Mother Goose partly because of the horse, the Grey Goose, but also because she was the only mother on the team. And her two young children were everywhere in tow with her while she rode and um, did what she loved. And they grew to know and love horses and animals just as she did. Um, and so she had a habit of speaking to her horse out loud cross country. And it's something that really she tells in the story, saved her and got her around that course in Lemulin. But it inspired me because I watched that as a kid. So it entered into my consciousness that it was real, that you could just like tell and sort of show a horse, well, this is what we're going to do, buddy. <laughs> and I did it with my horse. And um, so we share some stories about that and what um, is possible. Years after all of this amazing success, right on the cusp of some great things, when her daughter Andy was 19, in her year between high school and university, where she was poised to take courses to carry on in the realm of sports therapy and work alongside her mother, helping horses and riders. Tragedy struck, and on a rafting trip gone badly, the worst happened and she disappeared. And Kim had to deal with every mother's worst fear. The months of not knowing, although she said that she knew the day of in her heart. She had the months of not knowing and the confirmation that her daughter Andy had been abducted and murdered. I'm here to say we are far enough on the other side of that, that Kim sparkles again. So we're going to find out a little bit about how that happens. But that wasn't even the end of her struggles. A few years after that, just after she reemerged from what she calls the gray zone, Kim had a rollover car accident and a near-death experience that really nearly claimed her life. And she, at the time, wished it would have. But she was not allowed to go to a place that she describes in the podcast of beauty and light because she had a job to do. And so I'm here to tell you, I'm really glad that she got sent back. And in the end, so is she because she's living her life's purpose. And her life's purpose is a beautiful thing. She has messages from Gideon. Her horse, Gideon Goodhart, is a 29-year-old stallion. 
And she bred him with her old age in mind, um, planning to have a relatively small horse and has this beautiful package of a horse that has done a bit of every kind of teaching with her that has evolved into helping humans learn more about themselves and evolve. So a long time ago, she accepted that horses could talk to us and has been made fun of it for years. And she took it on the chin and has carried on. I've only come to this realm really um, fairly recently. And I came in through the side door of science. And when I understood the science behind how our nervous systems interacted and how the energy field from our heart interacted, then I was hooked and went down the rabbit hole. And now I'm in. <laughs> so get ready to go down a rabbit hole with Kim about talking to horses and the possibilities and how she found joy in her life. Now, this comes with a caveat. The sound gods did not play nicely on that day. Mercury was in retrograde. <laughs> And Kim's recording came out garbled. In some parts, I will actually interrupt and give you my quotes and rendition of it and then re-deliver you to what on the other side is a little bit of a rocky ride to hear, but is sure worthwhile because this is Kim Effin Walness and she is Netflix worthy. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Kim. In my introduction... And in many articles that I have encouraged others to read and clips to see, I have introduced you to the world because we could spend all day trying to do that and cover your really incredible life story. I have said that it's um, a Netflix series worthy life. Like it's even bigger than um, just a movie. And I think sometimes when we have a life that you might describe as Netflix series worthy, it's a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it means you've, you've been through a lot. You have certainly overcome a lot. And um, your story, I think, is important at this time, not just for horse people. All of us horse nerds have known you since we were teenagers. <laughs> I've been following you since the 80s. We've read about you and got everything we could get our hands on about you and your horse. And those stories are wonderful. And um, we will definitely touch on some of them today. But I think at this time, there's a broader need for your story. I mean, we just have to flick on the television and watch the news and we can get really caught up in um, the outside dramas as well as be suffering through our own personal traumas and um, lead us to wonder how on earth we can find joy and hope again. And in my own experience, it's been through connecting with stories of my elders and stories like yours that have given me hope in really dark times that there will be light again and kept me going. And by God, I've been glad every single time because I will have found the light over and over again. If this is resonating with you and you've ever felt a little lost as you navigate conflicting data from horse pros across the disciplines, all claiming to have their own methods or recipes for making magic with horses, and you want the clarity and confidence to make sense of it all, I have a roadmap for you. Check out our foundation course. Consider it Horsecraft 101, from amateur to magician, making magic with horses. A unique group coaching program with live online support that helps adult amateurs from non-horsey families who are seeking understanding and connection become the best stewards for their horses in nine weeks without conflicting data, lack of knowledge, or not knowing where to go to for help. So they understand how and why horses think and react the way they do to create a relaxed and confident relationship. If you're still on the fence, we have a freebie for you. If you're ready, so are we. You can get started at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, take a chance and remember, anything is possible. So when um, I'm sharing about your story, I find that um, 
I have been getting some feedback and questions from listeners and things that they want to know. Um, and I have a question here that I can read. They want to know how you kept up hope through your dark times with a lot of challenges. You had the loss of your daughter, Andy, which is something that is every mother's worst nightmare, as well as a car accident that very nearly claimed your life. Um, and you're looking at the news the same as everybody else is every day, but <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, I take a news break too. No, so maybe there's a secret. Yeah. So um, I came to you for some life coaching sessions and I'm, I'm opening up discussion today for others on how you maintain hope and find trust in, in uh, uncertain times and maybe can share some stories of your own or from your ancestors that can give us hope? Well, to start with the ancestors, my father's mother immigrated from Poland. And so he was a first generation um, American born in Baltimore near the docks. So he had a rough life. And his dad, my dead father, died when my father was young of tuberculosis. So my grandmother had to raise the children, five of them, on her own. And she did that with um, a little corner store in the row houses. She lived above the store. And, and you know, some of my earliest memories are of visiting her and waking to the cries of the street vendors with the horse drawn. It was amazing. Couples for sale and I see one down scared little me, you know, and run out in my pajamas to get the horse. <laughs> and it was just a real community back then. We had a lot of community back then. And my dad uh, went through World War II and was a prisoner of war for all four years of the Japanese. So in Ontario, so that was a hell region that he survived and came back from. My mother, her parents, of course, went through the Depression. Um, and my and dad were born toward the end of the Depression. And, and they lived in a tent for years while my grandfather, on that side, built their brick home. And um, my, my mother survived with Syria. I mean, they went through in the tent. You know, they, they went through an terrible times back then of poverty and not knowing how they were going to survive, but they kept going. And then things turned around and and um, and the world began to build hope again. And certainly here in the United States we began to build hope. And, and, and in the 60s there was a real rise in hope, although there was this whole fear of the Cold War. I mean, you and I have discussed how we grew up with that threat, constant threat, the Cold War, and being taught how to shelter under your desk with your arms over your head in the event of a nuclear blast as if that would have done anything, but it made us all feel better. And I remember uh, first being in the military, my dad was often stationed at military installations which were our prime targets, and then he ended up in his last posting in the Washington, D.C. area, working for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And when we moved there, I was in middle school. And I remember every time the firehouse siren went off, I thought it was an air raid. And it, was, it terrified me. I went through a lot of anxiety the first year. And then it seemed like everywhere else I lived after that, it was near some kind of, like, a munitions plant or some other kind of prime target. And eventually, I just had to let go of it all. Like, you know, we're either going to blow up in a heartbeat and it'll all be over, or we're going to live our lives. So why live in a state of anxiety about that? And then in the 60s, that's when things started to get on an uptick. You know, we're going to the moon, and there's all this you know, pride in America, and we're building. Then that whole horrible round of assassinations happened, started. John Kennedy, I was in high school for the number of the announcement when we had been signed to class. And just some shock came over the nation. And then Bobby Kennedy and then Martin Luther 
Okay. And I remember sitting in my college dorm room when Martin Luther King was killed and just discussing with other folks how it seemed like the world was ending. You know, where where is the goodness? Where has it gone? And we survived all that. We did. We survived all that. And so you know now I've been on the planet for seven decades and I see I see how it goes, the cycles. It all goes in cycles. It goes through really tough, challenging times, and then we come out and it gets better, and then we go through another tough, challenging time, and it cycles. So you can, there is trust that as dark as it may seem, there will eventually be light. And, and this is how I got through the tough times in my life. I'm not going to say that I've never been depressed, but I have been I have gone through years of depression. I think it's not the other side of it. A friend of mine who had also been through extreme trauma once said to me, in the times that were toughest, I would just look at the clock and I would think, I made it through another second. Mm -hmm. I made it through another second. And she would build from there. And I held on to that in my own darkest times after Andy's death. That was a tough one. I, I didn't want to be here. Was not interested in being on the planet anymore. We were so close, and the awful future was entwined. She was going to graduate from college and some type of sports therapy, and we were going to work together. And, and it was a really tough one. And I went through um, separation from my husband and divorced in '90. He was abducted and murdered in '91, and then the car wreck was '96. So it was a lot. All at once. So I had just started to come out of the depression. It was three years with Andy. I just was in this gray zone. And you know what really brought me out of that? I was sitting under a tree in West Virginia because nature was my solace. And I was just sitting under a tree writing in my journal and I glanced up and there was this little tiny, tiny little plant growing out of a rock with a purple flower on it. And, and it was like all of a sudden the sun broke through. <laughs> it shifted things in me. At this point, the quality of the audio cut out and I'm going to do my best to give you a sense of what Kim said and a few quotes actually from her. She said, uh, and I think that's also something that I've learned. She said that there are times that we go through deep, deep, dark challenges and she said, we can't make those challenges into anything shorter, any other story than what they are supposed to be. That those challenges are going to be there until we begin to learn something from them, whatever that is. She said, it might be something pretty darn subtle. But when it begins to seep in and you own it, when that time is over, then things will start to shift. So she said, it's really a matter of endurance sometimes. And she said, you know, horses have taught me a lot with that. She said, you know, when horses are in pain, they go to that place, to that deep, grounded, quiet, solid place of endurance. She said, I would so often draw on that energy. Just finding that place of grounded, centered, that I just have to get through this feeling. And trust that everything was working for my greatest good. Though, she said, it sure didn't seem like it at the time. She said, when the soup is boiling, it may not seem like it. <laughs> Kim has um, given us quite a perspective um, and a visual that I've seen as the vet's daughter of animals enduring recovery from trauma and the stages they go through. And we know what it's like to go through that stage and that it's only a stage. And sometimes you just have to dig deep and, uh, and live second by second. I'll get you back to her words now. Well, the same thing happened after my car wreck. I went into a deep depression. Not because of the damage to my body, um, but more because I had a near death experience. And I had to be revived. 
of where I went when I died was so totally awesome. <laughs> so bright, so full of love, so amazing. I didn't want to do that. I wasn't, I wasn't given the choice. I was full of I had to do that. I wasn't happy about it. Mm-hmm. Not happy about it. So I went to a year of sort of being not only depressed but angry. I'm having to do that. And then I got myself. Yeah. Forward. Yeah. Find some um, common threads there in finding um, solace in nature and being kind of surprised by a moment when joy has returned again after so much darkness. I too did not want to be on the planet, but am compelled or was compelled to be here for my children through the dark times. So I I hung on because I need to show them that it's possible and it it is possible to find joy in this world and beauty. We're we're surrounded by it. Um, And having horses certainly can be very grounding. And I'm very interested to hear about how you partner with horses. We've heard previously about an amazing partnership with the Grey Goose. And there is one story in particular that I would like to touch on that has been told elsewhere that um, was of you in competition. I believe it was Le Moulin in 1982. And it was five weeks after you had a transverse fracture of two vertebrae, if I understand correctly. So damage to your spinal cord. And in the middle of a course, a big jumping effort and those just tentatively healed fractures broke loose. And can you tell us about what happened from that point on in the middle of this enormous daunting cross-country course? Yes, that was an amazing, was an amazing moment because uh, up to that point, I was healed enough that I was doing well with them. There wasn't any, you know, there was discomfort, but not pain. And then two picnic tables, maximum height, maximum width, in a one-stride combination. And he left off a long spot over the first one, so he had to make a really big effort over the second one. And, and when he did that stretch, and I stretched with him, of course, to give him his head, both bones were loose. Immediately, my left leg stopped working properly. And the whole left side of my body, I could hang on to the main. So many thoughts went through my head in that instant. When he landed, he knew. He knew I was in trouble. He felt that I didn't land evenly in my feet. And, and he kept in like, and, and I, you know, it's just so, it's so fast in the, in the thought realm. But it's like, wow. We're the anchor of the team. We are not individuals in this world championship. We are the anchor of the team. And I, I'm sorry, buddy, after all these miles of roads and facts, and you're carrying 25 pounds of lead, and all this effort you've already expended, this is about halfway through the world. I can't help you. I am, you know, in, in, in those days, as you well know, Paige, in the long format, you really had to help your horse toward the end of the course. They would get tired then. You try to be off and get tired. You know, this condition is enormous. It's an insane thing. Then they stir red. You have heart to burn. But there was this big water jump. So it was the second to last chance on the course. And it was a big water complex. And it was complicated. And, and a Swiss rider had already died there. Horrible accident. His horse um, did a rotational fall and landed on him and he died. And so we had to face that without me being able to help break through the water. It was, it was like a bridge in the water. There was a fountain spewing water on the far side. There were ducks. You know, all this was new back then. We had to jump over the bridge. It wasn't a bank type bridge. And I was like, Okay, you know, flashing through my mind. I don't know how we're going to get this done, but we're just going to keep going. We're just going to go do it. <laughs> and I hung on to the main. Ray and I had spent so much time learning for him to follow my eye. 
so that I didn't have to steer him all the time. And so I, we had to rely completely on that. And Jack Goff had said to us, it's important that everybody gets home. There will be no taking of any of the sport options. You will go the long way around. What the? I'm losing time here. <laughs> I'm taking the shortcuts because <laughs> I knew my horse could do them. So that's what we did. And he was magnificent. And he was so careful over the drops. He didn't want to lose me. And he just, uh, and, you know, he just burned speed in between. And he was magnificent through the water. And, and we crossed the finish line a few seconds late, which is what not because we would have, if had we stayed on our dressage floor, we would have won. But because of those time penalties, we ended up coming in for You know, it all worked out. Everybody was great. And then but the next day was, oh, that was definitely a hell region. Because I walked in so much pain. And you know, all I could do was walk. And if I stood still, it hurt to me. So I walked all day long. And of course, I was the third to last flight of the dog. <laughs> it was all day. And then I had to get up on that. Beautiful. Now, a few things stand out from your stories about the gray and about Jack Lagoff, who we both trained with. Uh, one was that I know of very few people that could convince Jack Lagoff to let his agenda go and do it their own way. You may be one of the only people, especially when your way was considered to be quite unconventional in, in the realm of woo-woo. So you spoke to the gray over fences. You told him what to expect when he was coming. And you say, when you teach your clinics now, you speak to the horses in the clinics. You also talk about sending him images that he learned to follow your eye. And this reminds me of a story of Pat Burgess, who's a famous um, older rider, unfortunately no longer with us, who trained um, quite famous European riders. And at a clinic, she told me to just send the horse an image of what I wanted and to accept that, that horses think in images and they can receive them from us. And she said, don't ask how I know, just do it, as only an 82 year old could, you know. And um, as I've been delving more into the science of nonverbal communication, I have let go of my um, limiting beliefs about that being woo-woo. And you have always believed that horses could communicate with us through our thoughts, I, uh, from what I know about you. And now with your stallion Gideon, in fact, you have messages that horses, that Gideon wants humans to know about life and our worries and struggles. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to um, how you communicate with horses and uh, what it's like to communicate with Gideon. Well, I am a highly sensitive and empathic person. And that has always I feel. So some people see stuff, some people hear stuff. I really feel things. So I would get early messages as a child just would come to me a lot through feelings, but also just in my mind. And my mind would translate that into words. So that uh, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. Horses pick up the uh, vision that most of us think we think in pictures as well as words. And they pick that up. And for me, not everybody needs to speak out loud, but for me, I need to speak out loud for it to work well. With Gideon, it was kind of the, the same way. But one day, Gideon said to me, it was a day when I was offered a choice. I was practicing for a dressage test that was coming up. And there were uh, three other people riding in the arena, two of them trainers. Uh, one was teaching a lesson, and there was the owner of the farm. So the, there were other horses, but they were respectful of the fact that I was practicing for a test. And I, so I ride down the center line, and I hop, and I salute, and I put my legs on, and give him a few statue. I ask again, and I ask harder, and, I'm, and, and I go, okay, great, something. 
I need to pay attention here. Quietness about it. That I'm waiting. I got a feeling of waiting. So I, I said, I don't understand, buddy, what's going on. And what he, so he said to me, You're at a crossroads. You think you can do this? So maybe we can do it yet. Or I can show you a different way. And then I'm like, Now? Now. Well, we're like, Now. So I thought, This is important. This is a big thing. And, and I chose. Okay, I understand. You have something to keep me and I'm willing to work. And so I just went to my body to see where I might be blocking him. And it turned out to be my forearms were tight. I mean, it was really subtle. But the second I released my forearms, off you. And that was my introduction to going down the rabbit hole with horses. And, and since then, Despite how amazing it has been. What a journey. What a journey Mr. Goodhart has led me and many other people on. So when he comes into me, nowadays it's we just talk. But in the early days, it would be when I was meditating or in the tower or driving. These the times when my mind was more open. You know, what's it like? It's pretty cool. Now he has joined me in doing animal communication. So I never put myself out there as an animal to talk to my horses. But but then somebody said, Why well, talk to my horse and it would be a part of it? And I thought, oh I and it was amazing. <laughs> so my the right side of my brain sort of put it back when we started doing this work, it actually hurt. It wasn't a headache. It's like I was touching a muscle. It's interesting and that doesn't happen very much. I've been working at it and it's gotten stronger. I think um, that one thing we can take, even from your early days with Gray, is that the crux of the relationship and how it worked was your willingness to listen to the horses and to change what you were doing, even though it was traditionally done some other way. You know, there were things that we did with horses or things that were just not done and um, your willingness to think outside of the box, no matter what um, anybody else thought, is definitely part of your success um, and a lesson to all of us. At this point in our interview, our already challenging sound broke down, and I'm going to relay a small section to you. So I asked Kim about some work that she is doing with a group. It's called Tango with Horses. It's run by Andrea Datz and co-hosted also alongside Kim by Diane Barrett. And these women have created a safe space for horse owners who are looking for another way to connect with their horses. And it has um, a flowing format And right now we're having gatherings on the topic of trust. And here is a little bit that Kim has to say about trust being the basis of everything. So we're working on this self-trust. Because this is what the horses you need from us. It's not like seeing, you know, so many people going, well, this horse has a problem, we got to fix it. But so often the problem is really in us. They can't fix their own issues because they're such empathic, resonant creatures. It's very difficult for them to not resonate with our own issues and even not even be aware of. We have to work on ourselves. Yes. And so my piece that uh, I'm going to be speaking about on Thursday is uh, trusting your intuition. Not only listening to your voice, but the most important piece. Obeying you. Mm-hmm. Because how often do we hear that little voice and we go, oh, oh no, I can't because I'm going to let somebody down or people will think I'm this or I'm not. Or, no, I can't. No. And then we, we blow through it. And what's the outcome of that 99.9% of the time? Disaster. Disaster. Not just mess up, but disaster. And wow, we humans are so quick, huh? Over and over and over, we're like, no, I can't do that because, and 
So it's learning to trust your intuition and follow it. Yes, absolutely. And I'll say that although this is targeted at creating trust in yourself so that you can um, better communicate with your horse and be a trustworthy leader for your horse, that this metaphor spills into life. So in my own life, at a certain point in time, I was looking outside of myself for a savior. And um, that is never, ever a great basis for a relationship. It produces a very shoddy foundation for everything. And it was what underpinned my own um, relationship and and ultimately my life, um, is this lack of self-trust. And um, so whether you are working on it to connect with your horse because you're a horse person, or whether you are looking to rebuild your life, it starts with self-trust. And I've had um, sort of a, a question about differentiating the um, niggling fears uh, that we get when we push a boundary and something is exciting and outside of our comfort zone and something that is really a warning signal. Because I think much of my life growing up as someone who was just about six feet tall, you know, by the time I was a teenager and I had quite exceptional horses and ponies, the expectations for me were always slightly beyond what I was prepared for, very adult expectations for a child's life. And um, so I was always a bit adrenalized and feeling a little outside of my comfort zone and committing to things that pushed me. And I don't always know how to differentiate between the sort of fear we might feel about pushing our comfort zones and the kind of fear that's like, hello, you need to listen to this. This is a warning. Um, So I'm quite invested in what you're bringing to the table. And I'm learning now to slow myself down and meditate, um, which as a typical type A personality, I had before thought was not going to be possible for me. But I'm learning to slow myself down and meditate and to access my instincts and learn the difference between these things. And uh, I, I wonder if you have any, any tips about that or anything to say about that. I know what you have of the district. I've worked a lot on this, different, that differentiating. Because some of the most momentous moments of my life, my body has gone into a reaction like trembling, or my heart will start to beat fast. And there's no overt reason for that. Part of me that is not in connection with all things, the part of you in in psychological terms, it would be called the ego. The ego part of me knows that if I go ahead and do this, then I'm I'm headed more in the other direction of connection rather than separation. And I'm heading out of ego. And so it's kind of fighting for its life. So fear is felt. But it's not the same kind of fear that I feel. If I'm standing at the mountain block and I'm getting anxiety coming forward in an unexpected way, that I realize it's not my anxiety, but of course it's anxiety. And my inner voice says, do not put your foot in that That it has a different feeling to it. One is more visceral, the first one where there's a fear that might be coming from the mind. The mind trying to block you from taking a step that would go beyond your boundaries, that would really help you to grow. The other, I'm shaking because there's going to be a major change in my life, and, and my mind is trying to give me all the reasons. Like, like there was an instructor that I was going to go work with. All my business, all these things came from the new about why this instructor wouldn't be a good match for me in my course. All these things came forward that made me doubt my decision to go work with this instructor. But inside myself, even though I would shake sometimes in thinking about this, because my nervous system would get activated, I would there was a knowing that I should go. And I thought, and in the end, I said, I'm going to go. And if it doesn't work out, I just come home. I mean, what's the worst? You know, it's not such a big deal. 
And it was amazing, and it was life changing. But had I not followed through with that, I would have been very sorry. He did not show up in the shape and form that I thought would happen. <laughs> and I was very resistant to the whole process. This could possibly be the person. But they were indeed that person. But I stood outside in the driveway before even walking into the house to meet them. But I knew it was a, it was a, don't do this because your life is going to change sort of thing. But, but inside I knew it was going to change from a better way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think um, we would like to know how you help people now. I think people would like to access your services. I know that you do some life coaching services, that it's a particular brand or maybe your own particular brand of spiritual life coaching. And can you tell us a little bit about how people can access you and what you help some people through? Well, a lot of it comes from my own experience in working with folks. Um, Vivian and I are pretty much partners in everything now. He'll pop in if he has something to say that might be helpful for this person. And most people come to me because they want help with their animals, with their animals' domestic situation. Is could you please help her? Could you please help her? Is what you were saying? Please help the person who is calling you for help with me because. I can't make forward progress until she releases her anxiety or her fear. Or oh. her, there's something, something going on that, or it might be a dog and the problem is in the family. Or it could be a cat who is having issues because there's issues in the family. And so uh, it ends up being an animal communication slash life coaching. Um, most people who do come to me for life coaching is because the horse has sent them there. Vivian sent me to life coaching school. This is what we're going to be doing, and you've got to learn more. Super. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. And um, I wonder if, before we go, there's anything that you think horses want us humans to know or what you would like us to take from your life story and see in a movie that is covered by it. I'll hand over the floor to you if you have anything you want to share in particular to wrap up. Well, uh, Vivian has been waiting very patiently for his moment because I told him that there might be an opportunity if he had something he wanted to share with folks. And he's like, yes. So his, the main message that he would like to convey Connection is everything. Connection. Connection is everything. That's what Gideon wanted us to know. Unfortunately, much of the clip is garbled, so I have to translate and you're stuck with me. Gideon said that he wants us to know that all people, all humans, were born with a heritage, just like they were, of being able to connect on a visceral level to other beings. He wants us to be open when we want to shut down and to let others in. He wants us to connect and to listen, and that that is at the root of wellness and the root of well-being for all of us. I asked Kim a bit about a movie, and there is a movie effort on the way that was spearheaded a few years ago and was shelved around the time of COVID. It's the Mother Goose Project, and I'll have some clips here in the show notes that you can click on to find out more about it. Because as I've said before, she has a Netflix series worthy <laughs> life and a great story to be told. And more of that can be found out there. And you can see Kim's website, thewayofthehorse.com for more information. Thank you, Kim and Gideon. I'm so glad that he had a chance to speak up. There is much to learn from your story about um, overcoming odds, not worrying about what other people think, <laughs> and overall just connection, I think, being the source of courage in life and, and hope. So thank you for helping us to find our courage and thank you for steering us towards connection as a source of, of hope and connection to 
a greater reason for being uh, and looking beyond the chaos and the challenges of our, our lives and our current situations. Each of us affects the world. And we can choose the way in which we wish. Are we going to resonate to the, the drama and the trauma and the horror and the, the pain? Are we going to, what we focus on is what we draw more of. So are we going to like feed that or, or are we going to take a stand and keep our thoughts disciplined? Or do this. So this is not like happy, happy, ugly rock affirmations. It's just like learning. What do I stand for? Who am I? What am I at my base? Am I part of all of this anger and aggression and fear? Or am I? Am I going to stand for the goodness of life? Really, to figure that out and then live from that place and shine. So I I will look, I, I'll check in on the news from time to time. I'll either do it on the computer or I'll ask it through. I might listen to NPR on the hour if I happen to be in the time, darling. But other than that, I hold this space for goodness. I disconnect from the world so that I'm not in general, you know, hard to be under the net. That's not the resume with what you see. But I have compassion for that, and I trust that there is a divine plan because we always made it through the door. Mm. We may not see it, we can't comprehend it, we just don't have the money for it. Or it's not the right but it's there, and to put my trust in that and add my peace with my contribution, something that is building. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that we covered that. I think it's really helpful to people these days. Well, God bless you, Kim. Thank you so much. I look forward to uh, getting this out to the world and to working with you some more on Tango with Horses. Terrific. Thank you for everything you do with life. Thank you. A big, a big block in the puzzle for goodness here. Thank you very much. And for all your efforts on my behalf and the horses' behalf and... Thank you. We'll see you Thursday. Tango with horses. <laughs> okay. You have a glorious day. Have a good day, Kim. Bye. Hey, you're still here. Thanks so much for listening. What you think and feel matters. If this resonated with you, please like and share. It truly makes a difference. I encourage you to engage with the content on my Substack account and my socials, all at The Magic of Horsecraft, where you can join the discussion and shape the future shows. Tell me what you want to hear more of or less of, and we'll evolve together as we grow a community of like-minded souls here for the good of the horse. If you're an adult amateur horse lover looking for confidence and clarity in your role of equine steward, check out my course, From Amateur to Magician, Making Magic with Horses at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, I'm here to remind you of a couple things. One, underneath it all, we all want the same things to be heard, understood, and accepted for who we are, and to anything is possible. Take a chance. <laughs>